But first this hour, it's Friday, and here to round up all the week's news, we welcome Charles Griggs in studio. Good morning. News for Jack's reporter, Joe McLean, also next to me. Good morning. We've got Nikisha Williams of Jacksonville today. Hey, Dan. Hi hey, there. Jacksonville. And Shelton Hull will join us from Folio Weekly very soon. So remember, give us a yell at 549-2937 as we talk about these top stories. So let's get with our top story first. Again, Democrat Donna Deegan holds a commanding lead in the race for Jacksonville mayor, but so many people are still undecided in the election that it's really anyone's game, according to a new poll from the University of Florida. Among registered voters who are likely to vote in the March 21st election, 37% said they'll vote for Deegan, far more than the next highest candidate. That's Republican Daniel Davis with 20%. Al Ferraro, the Republican, has 8%. Democrat Audrey Gibson has 7%. Republican Leanna Cumber has 5%. Omega Allen with no party affiliation, 1%, and Republican Frank Kiesler also with 1%. Uh, here's the big number, though. A whopping 22% say they still don't know who they're voting for. So as we wait your comments at 549-2937, let's just open it up. Uh, Charlie, first of all, I think that 22% unknown is the big question mark here. What What's what's your thoughts? It is, and it, and it should play a factor down the road, but it from what I understand is many of these in the 22% are, are Republicans who hadn't figured themselves out yet. So that, that number is likely not to have much of an impact on Donna Deegan's numbers at this point. Uh, here we are, you know, uh, just a few days away from early voting and uh, we're about to hit the, the rubber's about to hit the road here. We'll be able to tell some things uh, here in just a few weeks. But uh, at this point, you know, Deegan seems to be you know, having the most success capitalizing on her name recognition. Um, she's, you know, creating a gap with that, uh, while uh, reassuring voters that her personality is sort of the thing that's, that's carrying her. And uh, it'll be interesting to see if she's able to turn her, her, you know, her name recognition into, um, you know, how people kind of comport that into her ability to lead uh, th- uh, the, the city of Jacksonville. So, Well, Nikisha, let me ask you this. I mean, obviously, we've seen a lot of ads for uh, uh, Cumber and uh, Daniel Davis and some attack ads from uh, those darker websites uh, and then suddenly Donna shows up with a somewhat issue-oriented, very calm uh, commercial. So what are your thoughts as to, to what might be affecting this uh, this voter reaction in the poll? I mean, Donna Deegan is a legend in the city of Jacksonville. People know who she is. They recognize the name. They recognize the face, not just from all of her years in television. In full disclosure, I used to work with her at First Coast News, but also from all the work that she's done philanthropically through breast cancer, and a lot of people have connected with the site. They've participated in the marathon that takes place every year in downtown Jacksonville. Secondly, with all of the mudslinging between Cumber and Davis and talking about suing each other and the JEA mess, it, people are really, like, sick of, like, the nasty politics. And so somebody coming out and being an adult about how they want to run the city and not necessarily fighting with the other members they're running against is a welcome relief and a reprieve. However, as Charles said, the 22% that are still undecided, I don't really think those are people that are undecided. I think those are people who don't want to say who they're voting for, for whatever reason. We saw that in 2016 nationally in the presidential election. And so I am encouraged by Deegan taking um, a front-running position, but that doesn't mean that you know election day there couldn't be upsets because of the big number of undecided either. News for Jack reporter Joe McLean. What do you think? I mean, obviously, a latecomer onto the air with a commercial is Donna, but it's a fact-based, or for her, a fact-based and very calm, issue-oriented versus Dirty Dan and all the others. So what do you think? Uh, is that 22% on the fence, don't want to talk, uh, split down the middle? I legitimately think because, I mean, they answered the poll that they at least... I, I I mean, I have a little bit of a different opinion. I, I think they probably are a little bit more undecided. I would uh, probably uh, agree with the idea that it's likely due to what we're seeing mostly play out in public in these media buys is uh, Donna, uh, a, uh, a Daniel Davis, Leanna Cumber, slug match, just down in the mud, you know, absolute <laughs> lawsuit spurring uh, uh, ad fight. While, whereas, you know, Donna Deegan, is you know successfully kind of using her name recognition in in ads and sort of having a more positive spin and i think that's affecting those other candidates too because we're seeing more uh uh positive spots uh for um 
Daniel Davis. It seems like there's been some tack changing. But I do want to say, I want to throw a little bit of cold water on the idea of this this type of poll. Nothing against UNF or anything like that, but it polls like this do give the perception that this is sort of a race, that that it's a that it's a down the track sort of horse race, and someone's ahead and someone's eking out. In a way, maybe that there's there's uh, changes in in opinion, but um, just speaking on behalf of sort of how news for Jax is changing the way we use polls, we're I think steering more clear of outright just reporting that Donna Deegan is ahead of the other candidates uh, just because of that reason, just because the only poll that really matters is the one when people are actually checking the box and the rest of it is just sort of, uh, you know, it's great to talk about it and certainly it's worth studying, but really that information that comes out of polls should be mainly used by the campaigns to adjust their message, to change their strategy. Uh, And so, I mean, uh, again, if you like reading polls, we love talking about them. Uh, but I think that I just want to throw a little bit of cold water on on that as something that it is an indicator of what's going to happen on Election Day. Well, before we get to the phone calls, before we get to Shelton, obviously, Channel 4 is going to let everybody see these candidates on uh, uh, March 8th. Yes. On News for Jax and News for Jax Plus. Thank you for setting me up for the plug. Kent Justice is going to be with uh, the seven of the mayoral candidates uh, and putting questions to them for an hour. So that should be a great, great, uh, um, uh, great debate. And uh, I mean, Kent always does a fantastic job. And Shelton, here are seven candidates. You can sit at home with your popcorn and watch, or if you were lucky enough to get a ticket, you can be at JU. I believe that's where it is. Mm -hmm. Um, This could change the perception or the response to the next poll, because finally everybody, not just those few who make it to those, uh, uh, those debates, can see and hear what these people have to say, right? Absolutely. It certainly could. You know, that that 22% undecided is, uh, you know, uh, almost as much as what the actual voter turnout is likely to be in March. Uh, the fact that 75% of the people in this city are sick of politics and don't really have any faith in any of our elected leaders is itself a big factor here. Another is that uh, the old way of covering politics in this country doesn't work anymore. Polls are not an effective barometer of a candidate. Strength and neither is a... Uh, Neither is fundraising. Now, as far as these these dirty ads or these attack ads between Davis and Cumber, they've worked. They've both uh, done well in the polls. And they've done well in fundraising um, by by going at each other. Because as we'll as we'll get to the the local media narrative, which I think we all kind of bought into, the idea of it being a Davis versus Cumber uh, horse race that worked to their benefit. Donna, you know, for a while, the only way Donna was going to even get on TV is if Davis or Cumber punched one or the other while wearing a Donna t-shirt. Now that she's now that she's introducing a commercial, you know, the takeaway is, wow, she's so nice. She's not as mean as the rest of these people. Now moving forward, you know, as far as the thing on the eighth, uh, look for Davis and Cumber to, to try to do a knockout blow on each other because what's going to happen is, you know, all it, just guessing, what I'm guessing though is after this run once we hit the runoff, it'll be Donna versus one of the Republicans and they'll all join forces. Uh uh, circle the wagons around their candidate, and then Ron DeSantis will dip into some of that unused money from last year, and he's going to flood the field. And uh, if if I'm Donna, I'm hoping that the t- the other candidates make some kind of fiasco of themselves that allows her to to take it all the way. Her, I would say that you know she should push to get the 51 percent right now in this first round. Otherwise, it's going to be Donna Deegan versus Ron DeSantis in May. And don't forget that on Wednesday, the JEA Special City Council uh, uh, group gets together to actually decide and announce what they're going to do as far as if, what if any ethics violations and what if any legislation they might opt to do uh, in the investigation into Leanna Cumber and her husband and the failed JEA sale, which could also turn the tables. Now, we got a lot of calls waiting, so let's go first. Hector from San Marco, he supports Donna Deegan. So, Hector, what are your thoughts? You're on the air. Uh, yes. My thoughts are, yes, my thoughts are, uh, I'm going to support uh, Donna Deegan. Uh, these other characters are just a regurgitation of corrupt politics in Jacksonville. And I, that goes for the ones that are running as Democrats as well. And Donna Deegan is a fresh face, someone we should really take a close look at and listen to. And, and you know, that's who we should really should support. 
I'm just tired of the uh, same Democrats who are just handing down families and the same Republicans who are just handing down their cronies. And we need to go in another direction, and she would be a perfect fit for the city at this time. All right. Thank you, Hector. Hey, we do have uh, from Tom uh, on our chat here says Donna Deegan wants to move the city forward. Uh, the mudslinger other can- mudslinging other candidates are just looking for a job. Uh, let's go to Stanley. Uh, Stanley obviously uh, says leadership uh, is, is an issue. So, Stanley, let's uh, hear what you have to say. Yes, I'm doing fantastic. How are y'all doing today? Wonderful. Yes. First of all, uh, I'm, I have been at the last three child revision. I am one, one of the most civic engaged person in this city. Donna Deegan is on the right track. It's not because she had the council and other issues. She is the right person to bring this city together. That's why I am supporting her because that last year I spent almost 300 hours in city hall. So I spent a lot of time down there uh, at those different meetings. And uh, Donald Deegan will bring this city together. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got Mark from St. Augustine, and he's talking about running a clean campaign. So, Mark, your thoughts uh, as we come into uh, the home stretch of uh, what I guess we could call the primary. Mark? Hey, good, good morning. I uh, just want to make a comment. I'm in sales, and one of the top rules in sales is you don't sell your product by tearing down your competition. But it seems that, that whenever you go into politics and elections, you're selling yourself. You're trying to get people to buy into what you believe and, and what you're going to do for them as an elected official. But that rule gets thrown out the window. And so people end up spending more time telling what their competitors can't do as opposed to what they can do. And I just think it's kind of interesting that, you know, Donna Deegan comes out. She has a pro Donna Deegan ad. And she's talking about what she has done and can do, which I applaud. I think that's fantastic. And, and we look at it like that's something new, which sadly, it is something new. I think it ought to be fair. I don't know why a candidate would waste airtime and money not talking about themselves and their own record, what they've done in personal life or a public life or business life or something that people could, could latch on to and say, hey, I like this individual. Uh, no, we want to sit there and spend our money talking about uh, what somebody else supposedly did and supported and all that kind of stuff. So I applaud her for being on the positive side. I hope she stays that way all the way through the campaign. All right. Thank you, Mark. So reactions to that. I mean, a clean ad versus, oh, boy, we got a lot of hands here. Let's go with Charlie. So let's just go back a little bit you know, with with this, with a seven uh, person candidate race. Uh, there is no expectation that someone's going to get 50 percent of the vote, 50 percent plus one. Um, the expectation is that you get into the runoff. Right. And with with uh, two Republican candidates who have a lot of money, their way of communication, their love language is negative campaigning. You know, that's what they do in order to move as far right as they can. They, you know, some of the issues that you hear both candidates speak on each other are issues that they were, you know, together on just last year this time. So it is, you know, it is really kind of comical watching these candidates, you know, speak this way about each other in a manner, but it, but in the manner they're doing so because their only uh, goal is to get into the runoff. They don't, they're not thinking about Donna Deegan right now. They're thinking about the runoff. And when, it, and it, when um, you know, after March 21st and whoever comes out, if Donna Deegan happens to, you know, to be the leading candidate in the runoff, then they will focus on what it is they need to do in order to get that uh, 50%. Well, vote. you know, it's interesting. I don't know if the computer or the Internet is realizing what I'm looking at as a journalist, but I'm getting a lot of these attack ad placards from Cumber, but it's split down the middle. It's Cumber points on the left and it's anti-Dan on the right. And again, that's that's probably just going to me because that's the way the algorithms are seeing. But uh, Joe, you had a, a hand I, raised. <laughs> I think uh, there is an aspect to uh, there's a perception on the part of maybe political campaigns, whether true or not, that swing voters are disappearing, that there's fewer and fewer people who will say, well, I liked the Republican in this in this uh, in this uh, race. But this, the next cycle, I'm going to vote Democrat. There's fewer and fewer of those people in that because of the political environment we're in, which is a tribal political environment, that the perception on the part of political campaigns is that, well, we need to focus on the Republicans are going to vote Republican. So all we have to do is make sure that people think that the other Republican is worse or the other Democrat uh, is worse. And I think that's the sort of just a symptom of the political environment that we're in. 
Yeah. Nikisha, did you have a virtual hand raised there for a comment? <laughs> um, I think what Shelton had said earlier was pretty much head on, that a lot of people are looking, um, that if we're looking down the line to the runoff, then it's going to be Donna Deegan versus Ron DeSantis and the bully pulpit and the trove of money from the governor's office. And that is very concerning. So it would be best for someone to get 51%, but with a crowded field as such as this, um, for the mayoral race, I don't see that happening. Um, but then again, you know, I, I don't want to count on the underdog either. So we'll see what happens come election day. And that's right. We have to remember there are more than just three people on that ballot when you walk in or if you're doing early voting and they do deserve a fair, a fair shake. And I'm expecting maybe one or two of them might have some higher profile ads as we get within the last two or three days, because very simply, their money can only go so far. But Shelton, you also had a hand raised. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, well, number one, if if Donna makes a runoff against one of these Republicans, uh, she could play this negativity to her favor by pointing out repeatedly and often in the in the ads coming towards the runoff that these are two people that were at each other's throats. These are two people that both use proxies to initiate legal proceedings against them, against the other person, allegedly. And they're going to come in and uh, part of taking that DeSantis money, you know, there's no such thing as free money. And part of that will come with the expectation that they campaign in uh, in the DeSantis style, if they want to come out and say, well, Donna's a really nice person, but I think I'm the best to lead the city, that's one thing, but that's not what they do. You ask uh, John Rutherford, he, he when Donna got 30% against him uh, a couple years ago, some people wanted him to go dirty, uh, but he, being someone from here, as opposed to these DeSantis people, they'll be pushing them around. If you go negative on Donna, you, you could face a very strong backlash given how much... Uh, a personal connection she has with this community. And, you know, we've got uh, uh, Miss Cumber uh, yesterday. She skipped a candidate forum in order to go out to Books a Million and get a picture of herself getting her book signed by Ron DeSantis. And she couldn't even get, he, he snubbed her. She couldn't even get that crucial, that crucial arm around DeSantis selfie that it is probably her only chance of getting past Davis in this primary. And so I think that there, whoever, whatever Republican comes into the runoff, they're going to have a lot of money. They're going to have a lot of support behind them. But they're also going to be uh, to have at least one of their knees thoroughly capped by their primary opponent. Yeah, a, a, May, a, a May runoff election is going to be simply about turnout if it's, about, if it's between a Democrat and Republican. That is how these elections are won here in Duval County. You get more, more people to vote for you know, in your area, on your side, Democrat or Republican, that is how the elections are won. Every, every time we've had one of these local elections, when you've seen the turnout for Democrats low, they've lost big. And that's just the way it is. We've got two callers on hold, so let's go to them. And don't forget, you can talk about the poll right now at 549-2937. Give us a yell. But first, let's go to William on the south side, who's a former teacher. William? Hey, good morning, everyone. Good I'm enjoying morning. this conversation. I just wanted to say for years, I've tried to encourage my students, particularly my young ladies, to go into uh, political office to make positive changes that they see and that inspire influence other young ladies and women. And it's great to see Donna Deegan doing this and, and being passionate about it and running a good campaign. And hopefully this will inspire girls and women in the future to run for these political offices where they will do a great job. And I just, I just wanted to get your idea on how this influences future generation of women to run for political office as well. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know that I can answer that. Uh, the only thing I could bring up is, as I've heard people say, there's always a mute button on your uh, TV remote. If you don't like what's being said, or you can turn it to another news <laughs> station, but these days, these commercials are everywhere. And like I said, somewhere that algorithm knows that I'm looking at political stories, and so they're popping up on everything I do on Google. So it happens. Let's go to Stephen in Atlantic Beach. Uh, Stephen, uh, you got a comment about uh, Donna Deegan? Hi, yes. Um, I was just uh, thinking that Donna Deegan actually could reach 51 percent um, in this primary, um, particularly if Audrey Gibson, who is also a Democrat, would see or realize that she doesn't really have the chance to get into that runoff and before this uh, um, primary, uh, throw her support behind Donna Deegan. I think Donna could win right out um, in the, in this primary. 
All right. Thank you. Hey, you know, the poll had a few other things in it. First of all, 84 percent of the respondents on that UNF poll said it's very important or somewhat important to have an NFL team. But only 61 percent, somewhat above 61 percent strongly or somewhat opposed the idea of spending up to seven hundred fifty million dollars in public funds uh, to split the cost of renovating a Tia Bank field, as I call it. The Confederate monuments were a poll question. People are about split whether they should come or go. Forty five percent strongly or somewhat support. 51% oppose, and the biggest problem, well, no surprise there, 37% of the respondents in the UNF poll said crime is the most important problem facing Jacksonville. Let's move on to another topic here. Uh, Also this week, Jacksonville is considered one of the biggest boom towns in the country, according to a new study. Lending Tree says that Jacksonville's population increased by 5% from 2019 to 2021. During that same period, median earnings rose by 12.8%, And with 600 new jobs coming to the area, that growth is expected to continue for the time being. So, Boomtown sounds like a rock and roll band name. Actually, it is sort of. But, uh, Joe, we were discussing this before. What are your thoughts and what did you find this week um, sort of related? Well, yeah. So so this uh, this came from uh, this this report on on Jacksonville being one of the biggest boom boom towns came from data that was drawn from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the American Community Survey, and of course the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, and so it, it, those are good sources of information. Uh, one thing that I found in in a, a report uh, we reported uh, earlier this week is is how these migration uh, into and out of states and metropolitan areas are occurring between the different generations. And it was really interesting to find the differences between the the older sets of generations, like myself, am, uh, I'm a millennial, uh, but the Gen Xers and the silent generation and, uh, and, uh, and uh, baby boomers uh, were all mostly really flocking to, to more of the Southern states, including Florida was one of the, and that was sort of the headline, was that Florida was one of the biggest uh, uh, migration states. Uh, of people moving into into the state of Florida, except for Gen Z. Gen Z was basically reversing the trend of of, of people leaving bigger metropolitan areas. Uh, you know, it was partly spurred because of the pandemic. Everybody was moving uh, to work from home model. and You didn't have to work from home in like New York City, Chicago, these high, high rent, uh, very, very densely populated um, metros, you could move out, spread out. And that was sort of the trend. Gen Z, though, it w- showed the the trend was they were moving actually into these areas. Uh, and that was the biggest exodus from Florida was, was Gen Z. So I thought that was interesting. Well, I'm a native New Yorker, and the New York Post recently had a story that indicated that New York City's proposed budget for next year is higher, larger, bigger than the state of Florida's. Uh, they're cracking down on speed limits. It's costing more to live in New York City. So if I were still living there, I'd be coming down south, too, because I have a bigger house, a two-car garage, and a bigger front lawn than I could ever afford in New York City. But, uh, well. Ooh, wow. Well, but then again, <laughs> there's other issues. Mm-hmm. Charlie? Well, I, I would say that, uh, you know, there was a time when, and that time may still be existing. We're you know, certainly still on the cusp, as they say, that, you know, you could come to Jacksonville and earn a decent wage and have a decent uh, cost of living, whether that was housing, uh, you know, transportation, you know, you weren't getting hit across the head with those uh, those costs. You could live here. Your earnings were you could come and make a decent salary and all, all be well. Now, housing is costs are going through the roof. It's very difficult for people to, to find affordable housing in this community. And because of that, I don't know how long we're going to be <laughs> one of those big, big, the biggest boom towns if we don't get this housing crisis solved. Um, it won't matter how much people are earning. Uh, because they won't be able to keep up. You know, it's, it's, it's getting bad. It's bad and it's getting worse in that respect. So uh, that's the main issue. That's one of the main issues that we have to deal with in order to keep the momentum going and remain one of those cities on the coast. Although my wife found gas for $2 a gallon yesterday, so there Ooh. is some good news out there. Uh, Shelton? Sure. Um, with As far as those demographic trends uh, you pointed out, like the, the lack of Gen Z and whatnot, uh, to a certain extent, whether the people coming here, the people not coming here, I think both are somewhat influenced by politics. Uh, when the pandemic happened, uh, Ron DeSantis took a big risk by keeping the state open, defying the mandates and whatnot. And yeah, of course, a lot of people died, but we also made a lot of money. And in Florida, it's it works out just fine. Plus, as a result of these demographic changes, Florida has is majority Republican for the first time 
in quite some time. Um, the Jacksonville, for decades, one of our biggest problems, ironically, was our sheer physical size. Uh, the, the size of our landmass, people, if you took everything happening in Jacksonville and you put it in a space that was half the physical size, we'd be, you know, we'd be booming even more than we are. Um, people, and so a lot of the young people, they want fast times. They want, it's like when we had the Super Bowl here in 2005 and you had national media openly complaining about the lack of illegal uh, things to do. But now, as we see with these trends and people coming in, and this is something that the next mayor, whoever they are, can really uh, make use of, we can start to use that physical size to our advantage because there are very few large metro areas uh, in the country, especially in the South, that can comfortably fit in more people. You know, like you, if you want to move to Atlanta, unless you got a felony on your record, forget about it. Look, I remember moving here many years ago, and the only thing I could find about it was that it was the largest city in, in land size in the continental U.S. There's still wide open spaces. Drive 295 right now. Drive I-10. Look around. There's wide open spots. Somebody owns those. Somebody's ready and waiting to sell to the next highest bidder to put in the next apartment complex that's going to cost you more money than you can afford. I did a film shoot recently in an apartment complex. I would have killed to have lived there when I was single. I could not have afforded to live there now, then, or ever with the amenities. I didn't even ask. So, but you're fine with your two car garage, though. Now. Uh, which is <laughs> yes, yes. But but again, I bought that house 30 years ago. Right. Yeah. You know, which <laughs> I, I probably couldn't do today. Um, so, uh, Nikisha, any thoughts to you as to the boom town reputation that the city has? Um. Yeah. I mean, like you know, the South has a lot to offer. You're a native New Yorker. I'm a native from Chicago. Um, but I think there are a lot of different factors at play. Um, the South is cheaper to live in generally. However, when it comes to, in terms of salary for like your entry level positions, they are often lower than they are in, you know, those densely populated cities like in New York or Chicago or even in LA. So when you think about Boomtown, it's about who has access to that Boomtown. And it's people who are working remote jobs with high salaries so they can do them anywhere and then they have chosen to do them in a place like Jacksonville because, you know, there's no snow, it's great weather, um, whatever the reason, politics also plays a factor into it. And that Shelton mentioned, you know, we have a large Republican majority in the state of Florida for the first time because during the pandemic with the state being open and so many tech workers, business owners, entrepreneurs flocking to the state of Florida, um, the city of Miami specifically, you know, they brought with them their businesses, they brought with them their money and they brought with them their politics and it's showing in how the shape has been influenced. And I think when you look at Gen Z that is like leaving the state of Florida, it's because of the policies. Like I've even considered how long can I live in this state? How long can I live in the city with the way that we are doing education in the state? Like it's not tenable. So, I mean, there are a lot of different factors at play, but with the housing crisis as it is and wages pretty stagnant, unless you are in one of those industries where it's remote work and you have a large salary that can afford you the lifestyle. The boom town is, is now, it's cute, it's great, but it's, is it sustainable? And I think that's the real question. And I don't think that the, that the infrastructure is there to sustain it in wages and policy and in many other, in many other ways. And, and you're right. You and I both come from cities where we could walk a few blocks and grab mass transit and get anywhere here Nice bus system we've got, but it, it doesn't reach everywhere. And some of those new subdivisions, like where I live, is a 30-year-old subdivision. I'd have a long walk to the nearest bus stop if I didn't have a car. So that's mass transit that gets you to your job and to your shopping is a necessity in a boomtown. And only X amount of people here uh, do indeed have that. We have time for one last call on this. So we've got uh, Jessica from Green Cove Springs. Jessica, your thoughts. Hey, so I just moved out here right before COVID coming from Colorado Springs, and I was a huge advocate for affordable housing. We were having a massive crisis out there, and I'm seeing the same thing repeat out here. They were having it due to the legalization of weed. It was dubbed the Green Rush. But out here, we don't have near as much, I want to say, attention to the issue but that's not the right um but like we don't have as many programs and any jacksonville's dealing with surrounding counties like my county clay county there's next to nothing out here but housing developments no resources so i don't know what jacksonville's doing about that all right i thank you for that well it's you know 
anywhere you drive, uh, go along Butler Boulevard, go anywhere, you'll see suddenly the wooden framework of a three-story condo going up. And uh, yeah, there you've got a roadway. There you've got bus systems. There you've got a library next to you. You've got a large shopping center. Um, everything you need is there almost within biking distance. Uh, although I think on some of these roads, it's dangerous. No joke with our pedestrian and our bicycle fatality rate to tackle that. Historically so. Historically so. And I do understand that because I used to cover that stuff too. Um, so that's good news. Well, you know, let's let's move on to the next and possibly most second most controversial thing right now. And it's our update that school districts across Florida are taking very different approaches when it comes to dealing with a Republican backed law for curriculum transparency that was signed last year by Governor DeSantis. The book requires districts to catalog every book on their shelves and put a formal review process in place for complaints. Now, we've seen those nefarious videos that show uh, empty bookshelves. We've heard of a, uh, a substitute teacher fired because he showed uh, that. He says it's the real deal. Uh, I attended the governor's news conference uh, just about two weeks ago where he called that all fake and, and uh, all made up. But yet, neither the governor nor the Florida Department of Education has officially asked for any specific book to be removed. And like I said, DeSantis calls the idea of state book bans a hoax perpetrated by the media. But teachers across the state are afraid of consequences if books are found in their classroom libraries that are deemed, quote unquote, harmful to minors under the new DOE media specialist training. And according to that training, a teacher can be charged with a third degree felony if materials are found to be harmful to minors. And that's the big scare for some teachers. At last check, DOE has approved a list of more than 350 books for public schools. But the Clay County School District is holding a public hearing on Thursday to discuss the new policy. So it's all across the board. Uh, folks, let's open it up. Who wants to talk about the latest uh, the latest uh, page being turned, pun intended, in the book ban? Well, Joe's story. So yeah, story. <laughs> I, I uh, being the News for Jack's uh, sort of the education reporter there, I've, I've been covering this extensively. I mean, it, it, with regards to the teacher, the substitute teacher who was fired for that, it was a video that went viral uh, because, uh, you know, everybody latched onto the idea of, oh, empty bookshelves. Uh, but then the, the district came back and responded and say, well, those weren't the, those weren't the only bookshelves. If you turned the camera to the other side of the room, you would have seen full bookshelves. But they looked like they'd been at the same, somewhat somewhat emptied. Sure. Yeah. At the, at the same mm -hmm. time, th this is one of those situations where, yeah, both can be true. Yeah, there were books in, in the shelves. Of course, it was three weeks later when the district posted that video. But there were they admitted there were empty shelves. They came out. The district came out and said, some of our principals and administrators overinterpreted the instructions that they were given be out of an abundance of caution because the message from the state in this and the message that trickled down to these uh, superintendents was that P uh, teachers, media specialists, principals need to err on the side of caution. That was the, the, the whole idea. And through that, that's why you got such an incredible variety of different responses. And then the other variable that needs to be mentioned is different districts have different resources. Union County has a lot different resources than St. John's, and St. John's has a lot different resources than Duval. Duval County was working with 60-some-odd uh, media specialists uh, for 150 schools uh, across the district. Uh, so they were basically strapped for that when a lot of districts have a media specialist in every classroom. So... It's more complicated than the schools are banning books or uh, no, that's just a that's just a media narrative. It's a, it's a, it's a, there's a lot more variables uh, than than just that binary. It could just be simply some teachers saying, I don't want to deal with this headache, so I'll just dump everything and, and give it to goodwill. And that way I don't have to worry about anybody nosing around. And, and so one, well, well, one more on. thing. One more thing I wanted to say was that that when I talk to people about this. Uh, who who are are really like looking at the issue? They, the, I mean, no one has found pornography in a school library or a media center. No, no one has. Uh, I mean, I haven't really heard any you know concrete example of a of a book that was demonstrably harmful for kids that was on. Because if that were the case, there'd be there'd be reports. Of, I'd be the first to report that. Uh, but it just a lot of people are observing that this seems to be a solution in search of a problem that people think is occurring. And at that news conference, the governor gave at the truck company on the West side. He basically said that pornography is a no, never, ever. Uh, and that's 
That is one thing that will never and show up. That's not controversial either. But yet we have some news coverage that indicates that certain parents are griping about a two-paragraph section of a book. Uh, and once that gets into a school board and a record uh, at a public meeting, then everybody freaks out about it. So, Shelton. Mm, that's right. You know, we were just talking a minute ago about this uh, this boomtown, this explosion of growth here in Jacksonville. One area where the growth isn't happening is teachers. Teacher, you know, we have, you know, over the, and this situation now falls within a, a pattern going back at least five years of consistent, steady, uh, uniformly abusive behavior towards the teachers and administrators in Duval County Public Schools and up and down the state. Uh, they've, they're chronically underpaid. They're so chronically underpaid that even instituting that little bonus a, a few years ago did nothing. Uh, they, the will of the teachers and the administrators was defied on the masking. It was defied on social distancing. It was defied on, um, on, on safety for those schools, even after what happened down, uh, down in uh, South Florida a few years ago. And what's happening now is, I guess what it would come down to, of course, there are no kids... Uh, Watch, listening to the the show right now because you know we keep kids away from information that's going to help them in their well, lives. They're in school, they're in class yeah. right now. Yeah, <laughs> and you know they'd be better off listening to the show, given the quality of education they're getting around here sometimes. But what I would say to the kids uh, from high school levels up into colleges, and now we're starting to get the same things at universities across the state. What I would say to the kids who are listening to this, and this will be true five years from now, ten years from now, if you listen to it. The fact is, kids. Your parents cannot help you. Your teachers cannot help you. Your administrators cannot help you. Your political leaders, so-called, will not help you. If the, if the students in these schools are upset about the books or upset about anything else, the only option they have is direct action. And, you know, now with this book thing, we're in March. Uh, the resolution of that situation, it's too late for uh, this current class of high school seniors. Uh, it's, you know, who knows how that's going to affect them in some ways. But we'll come back to the next school year, and I expect that we will start to see more direct action, more mass walkouts, more forms of social protest by the students. And then you can look to see uh, a clamping down on the rights of students to express themselves individually as well. Because ever since, uh, ever since the Marjorie Kenan Rawlings, uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas uh, situation, when those kids took the lead and made that such a big issue, that was... There was an immediate backlash to that, and we're seeing we're going to keep seeing that for years to come. Yeah, you know, I had high, assigned high school reading of The Hobbit. Somehow, I doubt that would be assigned in a high school class these days, and that got me into looking at other books, and I guess ultimately was a seed to make me a journalist today. So, Charlie, yeah, yeah. so you can always tell when politicians are serious about creating good policy because they put money behind it, they put resources behind it to make sure that policy is followed up on. Um, there is a common sense way to address age-appropriate literary content without this type of policy in place. Um, this is like using a sledgehammer to kill a mosquito. It is inefficient and it's clumsy. And at the same time, you have all of these parents, you know, who are out there saying, this is a bridge too far, but nobody's going to hear them. And it, it, like, like Shelton said, it's too late for this school year. Uh, they're already in, you know, knee-deep into, uh, about to be lean deep into the legislative session. It's not going to be addressed. The, the districts don't have definitive um, uh, rules on how they should proceed with this. With this, this is why they are taking the steps. Some of the dis districts are approaching this differently because it affects them differently. They're deep, based on the resources they have. You know, no one's arguing that that there may be a book or two out here that that may be not age appropriate. Teachers are trained to find those books, and they have a way for parents to object to those books mm -hmm. out of the classroom. You know, we don't. You know, I don't want my child reading this book. I got the note said I don't want my my child participating in this. You can keep moving forward. There's no need for this type of policy, and then all it's doing is harming people. Okay, uh, we're going to wrap this up with uh, Peter, who's on the south side, and you're saying basically everyone is missing a point here. Peter, go ahead. Yes, uh, I think the real point to me is that individual parents who possibly don't even have a high school education are telling teachers and the school districts what books all the kids should not be reading, or at least none of the kids. I don't mind them saying, I don't want my kid reading this book, but I do have an issue with them deciding uh, what all the kids in the classroom should and should not read. That was my comment. All right. Thank you, Peter. Well, let's, uh, let's just move on to our last uh, big topic, and here we were discussing about prices going up and 
Boomtown. Uh, in case you didn't hear, the JEA board on Tuesday approved rate changes, which for some could mean a lower bill, but others, particularly those on a budget, the bill could go up. Uh, this uh, was done one month before the JEA folks moved into their new headquarters, and apparently it has to do with um, the base rate jumping from five fifty a month to $15, but that'll be offset by the fuel charge, which is coming down. So some folks who are lower income and... Well, whatever. Who wants to jump in on on how well, some people will pay more and less with about a minute or so to go? Well, essentially, mm-hmm. people do need to understand that their bill is in several sections. There's the administrative, there's the service rate, and then there's the fuel cost. The fuel cost, which they say they expect expect to go down over the next month, uh, that's a variable, though. The other part, the service, the administrative, the, the, the first part, that's what will be going up. So going up, Probably, yes. The fuel cost offsetting that, maybe. So, cold showers, everyone. Uh, Shelton? <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, bikini season is coming up, and at this <laughs> point in my life, uh, I've given up on having the six-pack abs, and I'm just going to put a solar panel across my torso and save a little money that way. In a tax okay. Yeah. Charlie? I think they think that uh, t- rate payers expect um, progress, and they understand that there will be rate increases. Uh, I think that they, are, they appreciate transparency about this, at the same time, uh, they kind of scratch their head when they hear about JEA, JEA spending, or not spending, but uh, allowing, allocating um, dollars for other projects and in-kind services that could, those services could be coming back to the, you know, the rate payers. And, you know, Nikisha, back in the good old days, JEA used to say that they were the cheapest rate in Florida. Uh, thoughts now as, as a mother out there with a, a child uh, nearby, as I can hear? Huh. Yes. Um, you know, that was a one-time brag and it, it no longer holds true. The question is, you know, when it, it, I think it's interesting how companies pass on increases when they get increases, but they never pass on savings when they start saving money on fuel costs. And so I think that's the biggest question. If rates go, if rates for them go down, will they lower everyone else's rates or will they still keep trying to cash in on their customers? That is a question for another show somewhere. Maybe we'll bring some JEA folks in to talk. Now it is time for our (laughs) much-awaited lightning round. And here's where I ask the gang that's here and on phone, what are their top fun and frolicsome things to talk about? Uh, I can go first, and I want to plug again the Mm -hmm. News for Jack's mayoral debate. Seven mayoral candidates are going to be questioned by... uh, News for Jack's anchor, Kent Justice, March 8th, 8 p.m. Mark your calendars. It's going to be a, a can't miss if you're a voting citizen of Jacksonville. Nikisha, what do you say? Um, still on the same vein, I will be giving the keynote speech at the Democratic Women Information Network uh, event tomorrow at WJCT Studios talking about the election and campaign and the reasons to vote. Not who you should vote for, but why you should vote. So if you're thinking about not voting... Maybe come to that event tomorrow at WJCT from 4 to 6. And my esteemed colleagues on my left, Shelton? Uh, You know, we've had a lot of fun things going on this year and a lot of fun things yet to come. But as citizens of this city, no more fun until after this first round of elections. You sit down and... uh, Sit down and do your homework and figure things out. All these 19 city council seats, it's very important. Uh, You won't be asked again. And Charlie? Yeah, this one might not be so much fun to uh, bloggers and people who write about uh, politics. This is uh, Senate Bill 1316. It's been filed by uh, State Senator Jason Broder, uh, who is uh, requiring bloggers to uh, writing about about government officials to register with the uh, Florida Office of Legislative Services or that Commission on Ethics. That's anyone who's writing about the, the governor or anyone in the cabinet or any elected officials. So no. good luck with that. I could see a lawsuit coming on that one, but we <laughs> shall see how far it gets. Goodness well, much. that's it. I want to thank my esteemed colleagues here. This has been a blast. This is my first time doing the Florida <laughs> Roundup. Job. And with guys that I hang out, men and women that I hang out with a lot uh, out on the front line as well as in here. So Media Media Roundtable, sorry. So (laughs) thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, So thank you, thank you.